Thanks everybody for coming back to the Dalton Collective Podcast. Today I have got a very special guest, uh, Minder Fulden, as many of you may know, also called Jonathan Pritchard. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for taking some time to come and talk with me. Uh, could you give our listeners some introduction about yourself, what it is that you do, and yeah, keep, take it away. You got it. Uh, first of all, yes, thank you very much for giving me a chance to share my thoughts. Uh, as far reaching and wacky as they are, happy to share them. So there's that. Um, in terms of what I do uh, professionally, I am a consultant for companies who want to improve their sales, negotiation, presentation skills, all that kind of good stuff. I also help companies at trade shows when those happen <laughs> by being an in-booth attractor and entertainer to, to help them make more money and get more business out of those opportunities. I'm also an entertainer, which is how all this stuff got started in the first place. I'm what you like to call a mentalist, which is essentially a magician that has specialized in mind reading tricks. So my first paid gig was when I was 13 years old. I'm 37 as of this recording. So that's how long I've been a professional mentalist. So I entertained the troops stationed overseas, been out for America's Got Talent, uh, consulted for Chris Angel on TV projects, just all sorts of cool stuff. and. And as an entertainer, I help people forget their problems for an hour, and then they go right back to the problems that <laughs> they left behind. So I, I realized that having grown up in North Carolina on a dirt road in a single wide trailer, being a world traveling consultant is kind of a big change. So I, I realized that a lot of the ways I think helped me get where I am and that it's not too common. Not everybody thinks like me. So I realized, okay, I now have to kind of share my story with folks who want to make a big change in their life or, or live beyond their limits of their imagination, right? It sounds grandiose, but it's really just kind of nuts and bolts teaching people how to think. So that is the, the long story medium of, of who I am and, and what I'm about. That's cool. And I've heard you say before, um, something to the effect of, you know, maybe we've had modern psychology for about maybe 100, 150 years or something like that. You know, let's just call it somewhere around the Freudian era onward. We've had some yep. systematic notion that there is cognitive cognition in the brain and things are happening and maybe we could understand it a bit better. Mm -hmm. But you like to say, you know, that is, that is literally what magic is. And magic has yeah. been, been practiced by the human species for thousands and thousands of years. So could you tell me about what it is that magicians know about psychology and how they use it and how that's sort of different than like modern psychology or so psychotherapy, something like that? Yeah, uh, my, my favorite way to, to explain this is to talk about B.F. Skinner, who to me is fascinating. He is a behavioral psychologist who there's a really interesting experiment that he ran that he created superstitious pigeons, yep. not just pigeons that did weird behaviors, but pigeons who believed their actions had an effect on reality when there wasn't one. To me, that is hilarious. And the, the way that he created superstitious pigeons was he locked them in a box. So it's just straight up, uh, imagine just like a, a square cube of space with a door on the front. So he, well, the, the bad news of the story is that he would starve the pigeons to 70% of their body weight to make them very food motivated. So there's that part, but let's just, let's just ignore that. So he would put the pigeons in the box and there would be a lever and the pigeons would tap the lever and then food drops out. I'm like, oh, that's super cool. Uh, this is what I'm all about. So let me hit that lever some more and get more food. Cool. That is classic conditioning. That's the, the Pavlovian response. You ring a bell and you start salivating that kind of thing with the, the dogs and puppies, right? So classic conditioning, there you go. But then what he would do is after the pigeon believes that rightly so, that I have to peck this lever in order for food to come out. My input equals food output. Okay, cool. 
Now, outside the context of that box where the pigeon couldn't see what was going on, Skinner then set food to release on a random timer. Now the, the lever does nothing. It's now straight up random. But output must mean input to the mind of the, pi of the pigeon. So when food drops out, they go, oh, whatever I was just doing is what makes food drop out now. And then they try that behavior out. And then sometimes, coincidentally, food would drop out. So they straight up believed that that strange behavior, whatever it was, that's what they thought was happening. Now, that is a phenomenal peek inside the mind of a human being. <laughs> because here's, here's the way I explain what magic is. A magician or mentalist, the agent of action, creates a context for the audience to make logical assumptions that are later shown to not be true. That is every magic trick you'll ever see in your entire life. So the magician is the person who is orchestrating this whole event, this whole outcome. They are designing an experience. So magicians were the first design, like experience designers, user interaction designers, right? So it's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to credit all this to magicians. Everybody else is late to the party, right? <laughs> so, so the agent of action designs this experience, which that's the context. In the context of a magic show, you are in a theater, you are seated with other people, you are all facing the same direction. There is a proscenium, just like there would be a television screen and boundaries to the television screen. You now have a clearly defined performance space, a compositional frame or compositional space in, in art terms, right? So all of this is the context in which you experience this thing that the magician has created for you through their words, actions, their timing, their physical, everything that they do, everything that they say, everything that they don't say, all of it communicates something to the audience that leads them to believe that they understand what's going on. So it's the old show don't tell thing, right? So the audience is using their cognitive faculties to track what is being done, using their senses to, to filter out information that they believe is unimportant, to frame their experience to mean that box is empty. Well, that is a very logical assumption based on what you've been shown. However, in just a moment, when the cloth comes, when the cloth gets whipped off the box, you now see a tiger. I logically came to the conclusion that there was no tiger. By Jove, there is a tiger. Magic has happened. Like that's, that's magic. So you never, ever can understand or appreciate something outside of a context. So that's why people who say, oh, we need to think outside the box, literally don't know what they're talking about because you can't think outside of a box. You can only crawl out of your box into a larger box of somebody else's creation. So that's why when you take advice from people, only take advice from people who are living in a box you would want to trade yours for. Because the instant you put into practice their way of thinking, you start creating their experience and context. So that's why magicians, since before written history, paid attention to, well, if I do this, then that happens. Okay. Uh, it, it's kind of like uh, being an artist and trying to do photorealistic painting. The only way you're painting will look photorealistic is if you know through and through what a photo looks like or what reality looks like. So it is only by obsessive attention to detail and studying what is real can you then develop the skills 
to create a realistic thing that doesn't exist like a magic trick, right? So people say that magic and magicians, it's all willful suspension of disbelief. You go, no, you are making use of their critical thinking skills and their, their sensory input to, to just make them come to a, to a belief that they think is entirely logical and makes sense. They don't suspend anything. They're there to, to catch you, to yeah. see the trick. And you are just beating them up <laughs> because you are sidejacking that process before they're ever even aware of it. So it's like the magician is aware of what they're doing. You aren't because the magician is affecting non-conscious thought processes. So I think the, the concept of a subconscious or a non-conscious is, is way older than Freud, right? Because you have all these thoughts you're not even aware of. You're constantly telling yourself the story of what it is you think is happening. Oh, he just showed the box. It's empty. Okay, now he's putting a cloth over it. Now, oh, he ripped, oh, now there's a tiger. Oh, neat, right? So you're only surprised by the story you tell yourself. Mm. So magicians just let you lie to yourself. Magicians don't actually lie all that much. They just create logical situations for you to come to the wrong conclusion. And, <laughs> and you will believe the lie you tell yourself more so than the truth told by somebody else. Right? The box could actually be empty, but if I, a magician, go, and here we have a normal empty box, they'd be like, well, that's a weird thing to say. Like, I, I'm sure there's got to be something in there, right? Mm -hmm. So if I just don't mention it and I let you tell you that it's an empty box, well, then nobody's going to be able to convince you that it's not. I know what I saw. I saw an empty box. That box was empty. Right? Now, I... uh about that voice. I grew up in North Carolina, as I mentioned. So that's just the voice that's in my head all the time. So I am not <laughs> making fun of Southerners. That is me. Like that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> at the core. That's who I am. So yeah. Cool. That's it. All right. Well, speaking of, of mental abilities and mental performances, uh, I have a, I have a challenge for you. So I've, I've listened to some of your um, other podcasts. And one thing that's kind of always stood out to me is that you, you're really eloquent in explaining what magic is and how it works. Uh, but nobody, but we don't get to experience that in the podcast. So without further ado, I'm going to address the listener now. So listener, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, 10 objects, 10 nouns. I'm going to give them to Jonathan. And then at the end of this podcast, after we've had a complete conversation, we're going to quiz him about those 10 things, all right? So to give you some context, uh, Jonathan is, you know, a world-class mental athlete. He uh, does this literally for a living, and I have no doubt in my mind that he will be able to amaze you. Okay, so with that, get your pause button ready because you'll want to write these 10 things down on a piece of paper or just write them out on your phone so at the end, you can verify the ama amazing feats that are, that are going to happen. Okay, so here we go. Here's the list. My, my hands are off the keyboard. I can attest that uh, I, I haven't written these down. Mm -hmm. They're they're not in a crib sheet somewhere for me. Uh, I am I am totally being honest at this point. Like legit, I'm playing by the rules because I love this that you're holding me to like, holding my feet to the fire. You're like right. you talk a big game, Jonathan, but I've never heard you actually do anything you claim to do. So. I, I'm all for this. So if I right. fail, I am, I'm failing in full glory. So that's right. Go and, for it. <laughs> and I have not, I have not shown this list to Jonathan. I just want to make sure everybody knows that these are 10 nouns. Um, so here we go. Number one, mm -hmm. lamp. Yep. Number two, turtle shell. Okay. Number three, cup. Yep. Number four, banjo. Mm -hmm. Number five, router. Number six, sunglasses. Okay. Number seven, light bulb. Number eight, a sticker. Number nine, a fox. And 10 is a blindfold. So I have written these down on Got my it. side. And what we're going to do at the end of the episode, we're going to quiz you. Sound good? Sounds good. I'm in. Okay. So we've been talking about magic, psychology, 
Now I want to talk about um, mental exercise. So in your book, um, How to Be a Mentalist, which um, I've read and I recommend everybody read that. Uh, actually, you. you have a whole series of how to, oh, think like yeah. a mentalist, right? Yes. So uh, think like a mind reader. Think like a mind reader, sorry, yep. which is very important <laughs> because if you don't search the right keyword, you will not find the book. So yep. how to think like a mind reader. You, you talk a lot in that book about how to sharpen your mind and how to use your mind effectively. So mm -hmm. putting it in our larger global context, there's a lot going on in the world right now. Um, right. How does mental toughness and exercise, how does that all come together in your life and how you sort of see the world and how do you deal with adversity? For me, I, I think of the mind as a tool that if you learn how to use it, will serve you very well. If you don't learn how to use it, it'll burn your house down, right? <laughs> so it's just like fire. You can use it for productive means or it can run rampant if you don't know how it works. So kind of wrangling your mind should be a high priority for everybody because it is the thing that runs your entire life. And most of it happens at a non-conscious level. So most of your conscious thoughts are happening way after the decision has already been made. And your conscious mind just accepts responsibility and takes ownership of a process that has been going on for minutes or an hour or years before. And then you're now conscious of what it is you've already decided to do. So kind of step one is discovering those non-conscious processes that are going on the whole time. Kind of like uh, if, you've, if you've spent a lot of time around kids and toddlers and, and that kind of thing, when, when the cognitive functions just first come online and the language center starts and they start aggregating words and starting to form ideas and then asking why this, why that, and just building this, this library of associations. And then the nonstop babbling starts. Mm -hmm. And then there was a brown dog and then I saw a book and then I went through the door and Carl was there and I don't know why he was there, but he had a blue crate. And just like, oh my God, this is exhausting, right? Mm -hmm. And then you just go, hey, you know what? Sometimes you don't need to say everything all the time. You, you, you know, there, there could be an off button maybe. And the child is taught, oh, okay, this, this doesn't need to be externalized all the time okay, it doesn't turn off. It just goes inside. And now that just runs on the inside to yourself all day long, every day. And you've been doing that since you were five years old. So however, it's, how, however long it's been since you were five years old, that's how much practice you have telling yourself the beliefs about the world that you picked up in those imprint years that you gleaned from watching how your parents behaved, how your, na your neighbors behaved, how your parents reacted to your neighbors. Okay, that's how I'm supposed to treat strangers, right? Like all those things that you saw happen provided the context for logical beliefs about how the world works. And what's weird is those beliefs lead you to behave in ways that will create those external circumstances that will then further reinforce your beliefs about here's how the world works. And your mind actively filters out more information than it lets in. Because if you were aware of every single thing you could possibly be aware of, uh, that's called uh, having a seizure, right? That <laughs> you'd just be overwhelmed and incapacitated. So your, your non-conscious mind's job is to, to pre-actively prioritize details it thinks you want to know about and ignore everything else. It's kind of like you could be at a cocktail party and it's really loud. You can hardly hear the person standing in front of you, but somebody says your name from across the room and you're like, oh, I hear that. Or you buy a new car and you see that car everywhere now. 
right? Even if it's a 1994 Ford Escort station wagon, like I had, right? Like if I bought it today, suddenly I'd see it everywhere. Wow, imagine that all these years later, I still, right? So your, your mind is actively filtering out everything you don't value to show you what it is that you do value, which further reinforces your beliefs. So the choices you make are a consequence of, uh, to use computer science, software that was installed in childhood. Mm-hmm. So you, you've got to examine the choices you've made already in an attempt to decode the programming that would lead you to making those choices in an attempt to understand what it is at your core and being aware of your daily scripts that you're telling yourself on loop because I'm 95% sure that it's not good, right? It's why, why are you so stupid? Why, why would anybody like, right? All that negative speak has been in your mind forever. So your own mind is not treating you well. And if you talked to your best friend the way that you talk to yourself, you wouldn't like yourself much anymore because you'd be like, I don't like people that are mean to my friends and you're being even worse to yourself, right? So being aware that that's even happening in the first place is, is a difficult step one. So then giving yourself the permission to set the bar for success and making change so low that success is, is inevitable. It's like, you know what? Tomorrow will be a good day. If I wake up, I haven't spent a lot of time there, but I have been there before in my own life where I go, I hope I wake, you know what? I'm going, to. I'm going to tell myself, I hope that I wake up because I don't want to. I don't feel like it. I hope I don't, but at least I'll, I, got, I get one more day, right? That's a really tough place to be in. So you can't judge, you can't judge yourself too harshly in that situation. Set the bar where you can succeed. All right, I'll wake up tomorrow. That, that'll be it, right? Mm-hmm. I don't even need to get out of bed. I'll just stay in bed all day, but I'm just, I'm going to get up, right? And then once you can direct the future self from the present in a consistent way, you can then expand the scope of that control and go, all right, tomorrow I'm going to wake up and I'm going to put on pants. Okay, I'm going to wake up tomorrow, put on pants, maybe take a shower, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, so I, I have a fundamental hatred for motivational speakers. Like just it, I hate it because motivation is, is an emotional experience. It's a feeling. It's a transient dynamic thing. Nothing worth success has come from a momentary feeling. And if you are going to predicate success on how I'm feeling in this moment, don't be surprised when 10 years later, you haven't felt like it. So to me, uh, I've always thought that motivation yields results is fundamentally inverted from reality. It's results get you motivated. And then you go, hey, I tried a new strategy I tried something new and it actually worked this time. I didn't have to feel motivated. I didn't have to feel any way. I just did the thing. And then what I wanted to happen happened. I hit the lever, food came out. Cool, right? So so if you try something and it works, you're going to be much more motivated to, to try it again. And... I, I kind of break from the pack from the ultra materialist. It's all just cosmic cue balls and a pool game and it's all fate and deterministic, right? It's like there's magic in meaning. So your, your effects and, and your effort can be magical, right? Your lever 
doesn't need to be tied to the food, right? You can, you can superstition yourself into doing the right things because we're at heart not consciously logic creatures. We are cause and effect creatures. And if you can tie a magical cause to the correct effect that can get you into doing the right causes, However, the, the magic of meaning is inherently metaphysical, is beyond the level of atoms and, and molecules. So everything that we live for, all of the meaning in our life, is by definition beyond the physics level of reality. So I'm all for magical thinking if it moves you into a better place, into creating a better reality for yourself your friends, your family, the people in your life. You know, it strikes me as you were talking there that this sort of way of thinking is applicable in many different contexts. So, uh, you know, your profession, the thing you do is only part of what it is that you do. And in fact, mm -hmm. I knew you outside of that context. Like when we yeah. first met, I had no idea what you did for a living. <laughs> yeah. But the interesting thing, why I even bring that up is because we met in a place that's very difficult to get to, i.e. Mm -hmm. urban. Yes. It's, it's not easy to onboard oneself. It's not easy to make it work. There's a lot of, you know, it's very nascent. So it doesn't work a lot of the time. And I'm wondering if that exercise, having the goal in mind or where you want to be, and then working backwards from that, that seems to have served you very well in multiple contexts. So can you talk about, you know, other contexts that you've applied this way of thinking and sort of what those results were? Yeah, in, in the context of magic, when you're even just creating a magic show, what effect do I want to have on the audience for this routine? Okay, I want them to believe that I can predict the future. Okay, let me work backwards from there. What would be a cool way to predict the future? okay, I could predict newspaper headlines, but well, newspapers aren't really a thing anymore. And if it's a travesty, well, then people are going to wonder why I didn't go to the authorities and I'm a <laughs> douchebag. So that's not good. So maybe I predict the lottery numbers. Well, then you run into the same problem. Well, why are you here entertaining us and not in Vegas like, winning millions and millions of dollars? Okay, how about I predict random choices people make in the moment? Okay, that's cool, right? So so that guides your decision making there. Uh, making a painting, what do you want to paint? Okay, let's decide that first. Do I want to do it realistic? Do I want to do it abstract? Define your parameters for success. Okay, cool. When it was meeting my mentor, James Randi, my definition of success would be getting to spend as much time with this guy to learn as much as he knows. So how do I make myself valuable to him in order to get to spend more time with him. And I, I basically said, hey, uh, how about if I write an independent study through my college to come learn from you, I'll get college credit, I can get funding for it, so it won't cost you much. So can I come live with you over the summer at your foundation and, and work with you? Yeah, you're hired, right? So, so knowing what you want is, essential for knowing whether you're successful or not right mm -hmm. like <laughs> now in uh, to to side jump mental models and, and maps a very useful way of being successful is to fire your arrow first then paint your bullseye around it so that's a, a useful skill that a lot of people have they just go well you know what i was fated to to be here where i am it's the only way like no you're, you're in a infinite world of possibility but you made the choices that led the consequences of, of the, the outcomes, right? So not defining what your intended outcome is, is a huge misstep in strategy that a lot of people don't get, right? They're just kind of like, I want to be successful. All right, what does that look like to you? Ah, I just want to be rich. Well, what does rich mean to you? Right, like there's just all <laughs> every everything needs to be hammered down. So for me, it's kind of like success is um, success is liking what I do and who I do it with, and having control of my time. Like that, that to me is success. Right? 
in because having control over your time is the most fundamental uh, foundation for happiness. Like people think it's more money, people think it's the travel. It's really having the control over your time, being able to say no and mean it. So if you're not able to say no to something, I can't really trust your yes either. So the fewer places in your life where you can't say no, the better in my book. So if I have absolute control over all 24 of my hours, that's awesome. Because that also means that I have control over my time and who I spend it with. So to me, success isn't so much being fabulously wealthy. It's, it's just having control of my time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's, let's switch gears um, and talk about art. So an interesting um, analogy that I recently heard was that art, you know, at some point in the past was something that you could hang on a wall, think like a painting, something like this, mm -hmm. and how this was a reflection of what people were thinking and feeling at the time. And that over the course of time, art has become less and less something we hang on the wall and something we really adorn ourselves with, especially in the digital era where we can change mm -hmm. our appearance, we can change our voice, we can change so many things about our persona digitally that we can't in order to do in a sort of, in the real world or the physical world. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you are a very creative person. You, you create a lot of digital art. And I think you've been playing around with a lot of this idea of identity and reflection. And so I wanted to ask you specifically about the work that you do. Um, and I can see the sigil in the background there. <laughs> so talk to me about how it is that you create these works of art and what they even are to you. Yeah. I, I have often vibed with the Ayn Rand idea that art is, or an artist is a person who rearranges reality in alignment with their most fundamental values. Like, show me what you think is beautiful. I can understand what you value. So your art is a celebration of your fundamental values as a human being. So to me, that's, that's the, the function of art is to, to celebrate your principles and way of seeing the world. So to me, Urbit is very much in line with my fundamental values of radical self-ownership, of being in control of your own existence and connections, and the ability to say, no, I don't want to connect with you. No, I don't want to have Uncle Zuckberg in between me and every conversation with everybody in my life, right? Like, its, it's principles as a project are very much in line with my principles as a person. So that's why I, I totally vibe with Urbit as a project. Now, in order for a project to succeed, you need people interested in it. Like, okay, cool. Because they're willing to get onboarded. They're willing to scratch this intellectual itch of, what in the world is this thing and how do I turn it on? Okay, you've, you've gotten that far, you've turned it on. Now what? Okay, cool. It's, it's less about what it is. I'm more stoked about what you can leverage it to be, right? Because the, the cause, a very small cause with a fulcrum point over enough time can leverage huge effects. Mm -hmm. So to me, my reasoning is if this network or this idea is to remain in existence, once people engage with it, they need to have some way and reason to continue to engage with it. So what's the easiest, best way for me to spend my time to create as much value within this project as possible. I'm, I'm an artist, that's what my degree is in. I've, I've run a branding company for entertainers. Like I, graphic design is my jam. I, I love Photoshop with an unholy passion. So that, that was just the easiest thing for me to do was sigils are cool. Let me, let me put a sigil in a cool image 
and just kind of smash them up. And the vibe of the imagery will be a signal to people who vibe with the imagery that this is a cool thing that they should be interested in. So I, I unwittingly had brand guidelines for Mindrefolden and, and <laughs> contextual relevance for messaging because the, the way my, my marketing filter works is you speak to the public differently than you speak to an audience and you speak to your fans differently than the audience. So on Twitter, where I'm most active because Twitter is like being locked in a 14 hour car ride with me. So you get the benefit of every random thing that crosses my mind. I will put it on Twitter. So if that's your jam, come find me there. But Twitter is the public. It is people who have never heard of Urbit. It's people who may not be interested in it. It might be people who are actively anti urbit's principles which i don't understand that i mean i i intellectually understand it and i think it's evil but okay i get it right the people are like oh personal rights and property ownership is code for evil and you're like what are you talking about yeah so so twitter is the public so what what work i create for for Twitter with my sigil is just my sigil usually in wide open expanses with very little human elements to just communicate the wide open expanse of possibility that represents what Urbit currently is, just like the Wild West represented a potential, a promised land of what it could be. Right now it's a desert, so only the most diehard of the diehard uh, homesteaders are, are going to populate this area. But that's step one in order to turn it into a thriving community in, in cities and bastions of culture. So my public facing work is that vibe. On Urbit, I, I wanted to have the most active notebook possible. So I was posting up practically every day and, and whether it's notes, re, redoing old blog posts of mine, mindset stuff, posting some of my eBooks with free of charge because hell, you've already made it to Urbit. You've, you've paid enough already, right? So I, I like having a super active notebook that is exclusive to Urbit so that it rewards the people who made it there. And there, my sigil work is more of kind of future dystopia and, and hovering cars and rust. Because I love the idea that, that this forever computer that is Urbit, well, it's 2,000 years later, and it's still around. And now, instead of it just being me as a planet, Mindrefolden really is a planet being connected through this this urbit planet right like i just i love the idea that urbit is civilization stack for networking and and it's just phenomenal i love it it is straight in alignment with my principles so that's why i like creating art to celebrate the feeling so that it directly bypasses the conscious logic part of people speaks directly to their aesthetic sense and then they just go i don't know what this is about but this feels cool what is this about so taste leads choice right you just kind of ah, this feels cool uh, i'm going to decide to engage with this more so that's that's kind of the the heart of of my urbit centric okay artwork and i remember some of the early stuff you did um so to just to give a little bit of story and some more background for the for the listeners too so jonathan created this image of it's it, it had his sigil which is the kind of design you can see in his background which is like every urbit we call them urbit ids but they can also be called ships um sometimes you will hear them referred to as planets which is a kind of id anyway he he posted this image and it's it just said you know when you're ready and it was very inspirational and I remember that quite clearly because it inspired me to do the same thing yeah and I took some of the imagery that I've created from my time in the wilderness 
because that's one thing I really enjoy doing is backpacking and camping and put it and put my identity, my sigil that I use, Sick Dev Pilnup, you know, it's even a name that I internalize as me, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think is important. Yeah. And I created this image and it's something I'd like to create more of. Right. Um, and I think it's interesting that this is part of, or at least for me, it's part of my identity now. Like it's, it's, I've internalized it and that's different than my like username on Facebook. Right. Or exactly. something else like that. Because, you know, that handle that I have on those other places, it's not mine. I, I, I can't take it with me. I, you know, maybe I can change it, but that's at the whim of somebody else telling me what I can and can't do. Um, yep. And that's something pretty interesting. So just to give people an idea, when you, when you want to join Urbit, you're going to get one of these things and you can use it however you want, but it's yours. Yep. Yeah. And, and that was such a, a sense of accomplishment and ownership and pride that I had when, when you were sharing the, the, when you're ready, cause I, I was, cause I would talk about it and then people would be like, that's insane. I don't get it. And I'm like, yeah, you're just not ready yet. Right. <laughs> so then I was like, yeah, you're just not upset enough about Facebook. You're just not angry enough about being spied on and, and left. Okay. You know what? When you're ready, I'll be here. Right. So then when you're ready, Urbit with the image, and then that started spreading and then being in, in the main Urbit help chat, room and then people would be like i'm ready i was like yes yeah i love I seeing that that was just so cool i was like oh i have meaningful contributions to this community <laughs> i certainly do <laughs> <laughs> that, that okay. was awesome so last topic you're also a proficient martial artist as well uh yeah. so let's let's talk about what that means to have a physical practice in the world what does it mean mm -hmm. um to be grounded to be centered as a complement to what a lot of things we've been talking about which is the digital which is the global now let's bring it down to the local and the physical tell me about martial arts what does it do for you and how can people use that to to become you know more grounded and more present yes it is the most literal of self-improvement practices that i've ever found in my life Everything else is a metaphor. Everything else is an analogy. Everything else is reasoning from analogy. Okay, that introduces transcription errors. Hmm. Martial arts, however, is rapidly focused on physical reality. You, you, can't, you can't cheat physics, right? I mean, aside from Martians and UFOs and all that stuff. But anyway, uh, it's kind of like everything that we've seen reality is governed by a set of universal principles and being universal means that they are applicable everywhere all the time there are no exceptions they also inter accommodate they make way for each other they don't interfere with each other they can interact with but it's not like gravity has to turn off for electromagnetism to turn on they're, they're all, they're omnipresent through all times. Okay. So given that there are universal forces that govern reality, cool, got that. Now the human pattern is essentially the same. We got bilateral symmetry, I got a left and right hand, okay, two legs, two arms, cool. You might have longer arms than me, you might be taller than me, so there's, there's local variation. However, it's essentially the same pattern. So given that, plus the, the universal principles, there are more effective and less effective ways and strategies for aligning the human pattern with the forces of the universe to handle the forces of the universe, right? So a fight, I, I don't even like calling it a fight. I, I just, I think of life as a dynamic experience, mm -hmm. right? If you're in a dynamic situation, another person is going to be trying to impart their momentum to your body mass. They're going to try to kick you, hit you, throw you, punch you, uh, th hit you into a wall, uh, smack you at the pool cue, like, who knows what mm -hmm. they're, but at the heart of it, they're trying to deliver momentum. 
okay. So there are better strategies for navigating momentum. There are worse strategies for navigating momentum. So through time, we've had the best strategies for communicating how to do that by analogy. Uh, I'm strong like a tiger. I, I'm limber like a snake. So I'm not rigid. I'm kind of bendy, right? So that is a teacher's best way to communicate their experience of managing momentum. But it's always by analogy. So the process of martial arts as a study has been refining the understanding of how the human pattern interacts with momentum. So it is a function of mass acceleration, that kind of thing, with geometry, the, the angles of momentum, the vectors, all that kind of stuff. So the more you understand martial arts, the more fundamental awareness of how the world works you gain through experience. Because if you're lucky, you will have training partners who will punch you in the face with love. Hmm. They are punching you in the face because they love you and they want you to be able to handle momentum. They want you to be able to navigate reality in a way that enables you to continue doing it. So at first you get hit in the face and your strategy to deal with it is to get angry. How could you? You hit me in the face. How could you? Right? And, and then you, now you're arguing. That's not going to be useful, right? <laughs> you could ask them not to punch you in the face, but you know, you kind of need a face punch. That's, that's what you need to learn right now. So mm -hmm. you're going to get punched in the face. Well, you could think your way out of it. Don't punch me. Don't punch me. Don't punch me. Well, you're going to get punched in the face. The only thing that will help you navigate that dynamic is to do something about it. Physically. Physically is to move, is, <laughs> is to respond, yep. to see accurately what's really happening, then know what to do in relationship with the dynamic that, is, that you're currently engaged with. So most people are responding to what they think is happening based off what somebody else tells them that they're going to be doing. If I listen to what you tell me, that introduces room for you to lie to me and for your behavior to not match your words. But, but you told me that you would do this thing. So, well, if I only pay attention to what you do, not what you say, I'll be in a lot better position to protect myself and maintain my balance because you can't hide what you do. It's like, I, I, can, I can look at, I'm, I'm seeing you right now, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's even more wacky stuff, like uh, the, the sense of touch is such an ancient skill. It's such an ancient sense, right? Like amoeba can feel things with the cilia and everything. So it is way more ancient than vision. So you had photoreceptive cells and that kind of thing for, for a long time too. But vision as we have it is really com computationally heavy. And it takes a lot of our brain power, relatively speaking, in order to see. So it also takes a while to do it too. So proprioceptive awareness, when you touch something, is super fast because that, that ancient circuit is baked in real early in evolution. Cool. Well, seeing and understanding what you're looking at takes a while longer, 300 milliseconds longer. That's, that's a lifetime, right? So your mind actively slows down your sense of touch to match your sense of vision so that you're not out of phase. So you're not constantly living in a Kung Fu movie, right? I will defeat you and take your wife. Right, where the, the <laughs> lips are out of, out of, con, like, out of yeah. sync with the words, right? So it is so evolutionarily beneficial to rely so heavily on vision that it makes sense to do that. And we've gotten along really well for it too, right? The wacky thing though, 
is when you dial into the physical experience, like the feeling of your balance. And then as soon as somebody else connects, like makes contact in whatever way, you can backtrack, you can like hack their system back because they make connection to you where you can hear everything that they're giving you and you're giving them nothing. So it's a total one-way connection where they've just told you everything about their momentum, their intention, where they want to go, where they're going to try to take you, when they're going to try to punch you, everything. You feel it instantly before you can see it happen. And if you've ever done partner dancing, you know exactly what that's like. If you look at their feet, it's too late, right? You got to feel the music, feel their, feel what they're doing. So developing that, that rabid, just omni focus on your being, right? Your, your whole body structure, then it can connect in a dynamic way and maintain proper alignment in that relationship because you are better aware of what that dynamic is because you're more aware of your body than the other person is aware of their body. So it's, it's a really weird experience when you, when you touch hands, when you cross hands with somebody who's a really well accomplished martial artist, because they're always just a half step ahead of you and you think, Oh, I'm going to get them. And they're just not there anymore. Hmm. And you can't figure out why, right? It's just like, he's got to be psychic. I, I can't hit you. What are you doing? Well, it's because you're relying too much on vision and not too much on being in this moment because you're thinking about what it is you're seeing. So you're now two, two frame rates behind reality. So that's, that's uh, I talk a lot in my martial arts practice about echo time and real time. Real time is being dialed into your body and being present in the moment, fully aware of the dynamic. Echo time is thinking about what you think is happening. Hmm. So the person that is more present in the moment is a universe ahead of you who is thinking about what they think is happening. Like, good luck touching that person because they might as well be a time traveler to you mm. because you're stuck in echo time playing with shadows and they can reach out and touch you any way they want. And in the context of a training studio or a dojo or a clune, whatever you want to call it, that to me is one of the, the most profound contexts for respect and love that I've ever found because it is profoundly important and dangerous work to play with these forces. So finding a good school that, that you can trust your being with is really cool. Nice. Well, Jonathan, I think we've had a pretty great overarching conversation from the <laughs> far conceptual and digital to the aesthetic and to the grounded physical. Uh, but we did promise the listeners a, a little treat. Absolutely. Yes. So let's yes. do that. So at the beginning of this um, episode, we, we, I gave Jonathan a list of 10 nouns. And if you want to go ahead and pause your thing now and go back and listen to it or write it down, do that. Um, I have it written down. Jonathan has never seen this list before. And so we're going we're gonna to quiz him. Okay. And so right. I'll be the arbiter of correctness for our live conversation here. So First and foremost, we have 10 things. Jonathan, take from the top, from number one down to number 10, please. Okay. Uh, one is a lamp. Two is a turtle shell. Three is a cup. Four is a banjo. Five is a router. Six is, a, is sunglasses. Yep. Seven is a light bulb. Eight is a sticker. Nine is a fox. Ten is a blindfold. Correct. <laughs> Boom. So that's so that was the easy part. That was uh -huh. the easy part. Okay. Yeah. Uh, please, for the audience, uh -huh. recite that list backwards. 
You got it. All right. So, um, blindfold, fox, sticker, light bulb, sunglasses, router, banjo, cup, turtle shell, lamp. Yes. Yes. That's it. Okay. Now, <laughs> uh, evens in from number two through to 10. You got just it. The, just the even number, starting with two. Turtle shell. That's a number. Banjo. Sunglasses. Sticker. Blindfold. <laughs> That's it? <laughs> uh, I have a feeling that you could probably do this in any order you feel like, almost at any speed you choose, and any meter that you felt appropriate. Is that correct? Ye that's that's it and in any state of inebriation too uh that <laughs> uh that that was a, a popular party trick i i would do in college uh was memory demonstrations and then get hammered and see just how hammered i could get and still pull it off and but the answer is very yeah 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 <laughs> so um we, we won't give we won't give the secret to that, but I think well how we'll end this is please tell us so, so for people who enjoy this conversation there's two things i want to I want to say this this podcast was created for a group called the Dalton Collective, which i I helped start and furthermore, uh, I want to give the general audience here some more information about you, specifically where they people can find you, if they want to book you, all that kind of stuff. so why don't you go ahead and give us some of those details now and then we'll sign off. You got it. Thank you. Um, yeah. If you are on Twitter, find me at the underscore Pritchard. Uh, the, the best website for you to get to is mindreaderuniversity.com. That is where I have my kind of public facing uh, shirts and, and teach you how to do wacky stuff like that memory stunt, that kind of stuff. From there, you can find anything else about my my company Hellstrom Group or anything else. So, so that's it. Um, if you are on Urbit, find me at Minderfolden. Uh, as we are currently recording, I'm replaying 17 million events in my peer. So uh, it will be about three days worth of replaying. Then I'll be back on the, the network. So uh, come find me for the most active notebook mm -hmm. and in the Agora within the Sanctorium. Uh, I, I am basically on the network all day, every day, as I'm at the keyboard for my, my paying work. So it's really stupid easy to get a hold of me on, on Urbit. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and we'll see you on Urbit. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>